So like a lot of people, I'm pretty concerned about climate change. Um, and in particular, this deadline that was given last year by a panel of international scientists saying that we only had until 2030 to halt and start reversing the actual increase in climate change gases we're pumping out into the atmosphere if we wanted to stop uh, change uh, happening at uh, a warming of two degrees centigrade. We're already a long way towards that target. Uh, now that particular figure is important because anything above two degrees in itself is going to result in massive catastrophes, ones on top of the ones we're already seeing. And we're already seeing really significant things. I'm going to talk about some of those in a moment. Um, but also, once you go above two degrees centigrade, you start to get the concern that there'll be positive feedback loops. So that, for instance, the melting of Arctic tundra will hit a level where it's releasing quite large quantities of methane gas. Methane is the most powerful or one of the most powerful climate change gases. Uh, so that causes temperatures to escalate even further. And there's fairly respectable scientists who believe we are well on the route towards that happening, that that's going to happen long before 2030, the critical point maybe in about five years time. And that when it does happen, there'll be a whole sequence of positive feedback loops that could result in a increased uh, global warming of about six degrees centigrade. Now, six degrees, the effects of that will be absolutely astronomical. Uh, for instance, although this would take a couple of centuries, that sort of temperature increase would probably mean the complete melting of just about every major ice body on the planet. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, that means a sea level increase of about 65 metres, uh, which basically means every coastal city in the world goes underwater. But so do many towns inland, yeah, quite a long way inland. I'm in Ireland, and in Ireland, it basically means uh, we... The, the centre of the country goes underwater, Carrick on Shannon goes underwater, Dublin goes underwater, Cork goes underwater, Belfast goes underwater, Limerick goes underwater, Waterford goes underwater, water. Wexford goes like almost every town of significance goes under, and Ireland becomes a set of islands, which are where the mountains currently are and the hills around the mountains, uh, with the kind of big inland sea separating them. Um, that's disastrous on every possible level for the human population of the planet. And the other thing that's worth mentioning at the outset is I think it's easiest for us to understand the impact on humans, but we can't forget that we're already living through this massive extinction event uh, that's been going on throughout the last century and been escalating in recent years. You know, something like 70% of uh, the species that were on the planet 150 years ago are probably extinct now. We don't know for sure. Insect populations, lots of things like that, that were never categorised before they even went extinct. But that's what we're looking at. And a lot of the measures you're looking at, that's going to become much worse. Uh, and that in itself, even apart from the global warming aspect, uh, threatens us with climate collapse, uh, with an environmental collapse rather, uh, because simple example is bees. Uh, we're dependent on bees to pollinate an awful lot of our food crops. If the crops don't get pollinated, then there is nothing to eat. Uh, but that is that one example is magnified as you look across the whole spectrum. So it, if you, it, that sort of major environmental collapse for humans, it would mean a, an even worse collapse of food than what we're going to see as a result of climate change. Uh, but would also mean other animal populations crashing all around the place. You might even end up with an extinction event that looks a bit like the dinosaurs, but without the huge meteorite that caused it. So that's why I'm alarmed. Uh, that's what the actual threat is. Um, and what's been happening in the last couple of months with Extinction Rebellion is on some levels extremely encouraging. Uh, you know, they, they had a plan, they implemented the plan. There's all the sort of mass arrest stuff in London and while I'm recording this, you're getting the first sort of tokenistic bills being passed by parliaments or people talking about uh, passing uh, bills that uh, say, yes, we need to declare a climate change emergency. That This is the level of the crisis that's facing us. So what I want to do is, is while acknowledging the positive aspect of that and the positive mobilizing thing, is look at some of the shortcomings that are coming from that approach. And the reason I want to talk about those um, isn't just to have a go, uh, but it's basically because I think the nature of the crisis we're facing is not something that the program Extinction Rebellion are following can actually tackle. Um, and I'm going to explain why I think that's the case. Um, so the first and perhaps the most fundamental issue is the failure of Extinction Rebellion to take an openly anti-capitalist approach. In fact, they've done the opposite. There's been various attempts to 
uh, find favourable corporate interests and there was even a, an Extinction Rebellion business pro- page there, which I think was taken down, but uh, it's probably just under some sort of reconsideration. Uh, now, I think the easiest way to understand why this isn't just some lefty trying to add on to something but is fundamental is this particular graph I'm looking at here, uh, which shows the very, very tight linkage between CO2 emissions, which is CO2 is obviously one of the major climate change gases, and the global economy growth rate. And in particular, you can really see that in the context of the uh, capitalist crisis of 2008. Um, And you can see just how tightly, if you look at this graph, the way every single movement in the uh, economy growth is tied to an equivalent movement in the production of CO2. And that holds even where you see that crash and suddenly there's this big dip in CO2 production, which in any other context would be a good sign. I mean, if you're, if you're going, uh, you know, what we really need to do is slow down the production of CO2. You see this graph, the answer is pretty obvious uh, that in fact, what you have to do is discourage capitalist growth. That's all well and good. So what's the problem with discouraging capitalist growth? Well, that's precisely what you may well remember from that crisis in 2008. It wasn't a crisis just for capitalism, for profit making. It was a crisis for all of us. Uh, the capitalist system, because of the way the economic the economy is structured, uh, means it's what most of us depend on for wages. Uh, it's what we depend on for the ability to rent and to pay food and all those sort of things. Um, and it's quite a complicated set of interconnecting systems that in effect compels us to work for people who own capital in order to be able to live. The other aspect of it that's really problematic when you talk about climate change is capitalist crises are not unusual and in fact capitalism goes tends towards crisis once growth falls towards three percent or less. Three percent doesn't sound like a terribly large number could we sustain three percent The problem is that 3% over a 24-year period is a doubling of economic growth. And again, look at this graph, this tight coupling between the production of carbon dioxide and uh, and capitalist growth. Capitalist growth doubles, the production of carbon dioxide doubles. That's easy to see why that is completely not possible uh, going in the future. So what we need to do, sometimes this gets talked about bringing growth to zero, if you can't bring growth to zero under capitalism, it goes into crisis and then there's consequences for it. Uh, what we need to do is look at different economic models. We need to be explicitly anti-capitalist. That's why that's the big failing of Extinction Rebellion in not being explicitly anti-capitalist. But I want to go on to look at some other aspects and in particular um, the questions of who's producing all that carbon dioxide and how does that tie into the colonialist le- colonial legacy and why is that important? Another aspect of this is that while you might think the extinction of all life (laughs) or something close to that would be a very strong motivating factor to the point of view that everybody would focus on nothing else, uh, that doesn't really take into account that for many people, for many people's lives, there's much shorter term crises that are not as bad as that, but are so urgent uh, that they have to focus in on that really first. Um, And one very good one in Dublin at the moment would be the housing crisis. Um, You know, the actual threat of being made homeless at the end of the month, being able to afford the rent, being unable to afford rent because you're being evicted and the only available prices you can get are way higher than your current one. Uh, For most people, that's going to be something they want to deal with uh, ahead of worrying about what's going to happen to the planet in 30 years time or in 40 years time. Uh, You might think, well, they shouldn't think like that. Um, But actually, you know, that's quite a reasonable way to think. Uh, There's that immediate crisis that you need to solve first. Um, So there's a need for a uh, climate justice movement that isn't just anti-capitalist, in tone but actually is uh, what you might call intersectional Um, certainly brings in a range of issues related to justice some of which are economic some of which are to to do with oppression Um, and extinction rebellion on the other hand has had this whole thing of saying it's beyond politics you know the nature of the crisis is beyond politics 
on a rhetorical level, you can see why that's been said, and you can also see why it's been said to try and appeal to people across traditional party boundaries, you know, Labour Conservative in the UK, for instance. Um, but the Beyond Politics slogan doesn't really work in terms of actually building the sort of movement that's needed, which is a movement that also takes into account the, the massive challenges so many people, particularly working class people, uh, face in their lives in terms of just being able to get by. You can't park those um, in the expectation of, of uh, sorting out uh, the climate first and then returning to them later on. You particularly can't park them in the context of recognising that we need to move towards zero growth because zero growth under capitalism would be a disaster for a huge percentage of the population. It basically would mean they would lose their income, they would lose uh, their ability to have a, a decent standard of living. Um, and this digs in further when we go on to look at the next thing uh, I want to talk about, which is the question of who does the pollution. Um, so this graph, which you may have seen already, uh, gives a very strong indication that well, there's a couple of important things here. Well, one, it makes rubbish of any attempt to link uh, climate change to population. We've seen that from uh, basically a few kind of racists who are trying to jump on the environmental concern bandwagon and are saying, uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, we have to talk about population. Uh, but actually, the populations they want to talk about, which inevitably are the populations uh, of the global south, don't actually get to contribute very much to climate change at all. Uh, they don't have the consumption uh, that many people in the north do. And then when you break that down further, you realise that actually, even in, in, in the global north, um, it's the rich in particular who are massive contributors to climate change. To be fair, most of us are in a significant way. Most of us in the global north will have to face up to uh, a reduced consumption, uh, not having the same sort of things available. I think we need to have conversations about how that's done. Um, a very a simple way I always express this is, uh, if you think about, think about your need for transport, right? What you need for transport is actually to get from A to B in a reasonable amount of time, right? Uh, under uh, capitalism, that got very individualized, particularly in the last 30 or 40 years. So the only way for lots of people to feel, fill that need is to, is to have a car. Uh, that they individually own uh, and that they transport themselves from A to B in that car because public transport is either unavailable or is not particularly good. Um, it can also be quite expensive. Uh, so when I think about, well, we need to reduce everybody's consumption overall in the North, I think what we're talking about is doing that through a redeploying of resources. So instead of us all having an individual car to get around, we have really good public transport. Uh, a public transport that I think technologically we're already seeing is probably going to include uh, the availability of robot cars. So in the cases we're actually you know, you want to go to some small village in Ireland or you're moving house and you need to move a load of furniture, uh, what you'll be able to do is uh, basically rent a car, uh, perhaps auto-driven car, perhaps auto-driven van, uh, suitable for the particular function, but you'll have it for an hour or two and then somebody else will have it for an hour or two uh, rather than having your own individual one. But there's no denying that really um, the CO2 emissions by the world's population tell us a very simple story, which is that people in the global south currently contribute almost nothing. Uh, people in the global north contribute a lot, and the super wealthy contribute an absolutely crazy amount. Um, you know, and that makes sense. I mean, if you're you know buying 400 million luxury yachts, if you're you know fly flying first class everywhere you go, if you've got servants, then you're also all their consumption is going in. If you're building, you know, giant luxury ma mansions, which is loads of concrete, loads of new materials, all those things mean you're disproportionately putting out far more than any anybody else. Um, a, a, an idea for the overall figure, um, I was looking this up, and basically people in East Africa, on average, are contributing 1 70th, 1 70th, 7 zero. 170th, uh, the amount of climate change uh, gases as the average person in Ireland. Uh, so that's an illustration of where those differences are. Um, and the other thing to realise about that importance of who produces most of this pollution and who has historically is that it's actually, you know, people talk about climate change as, as something 
that's going to happen in the future and that in the future is going to kill lots of people. Uh, but actually, it's already happening and it's already killing quite a significant number of people. And I mean, the really unfortunate, I don't know if ironic is the right word to use, uh, thing that's happening is that the people who are dying at the moment are mostly uh, those people who are contributing very little to the actual problem. Um, the thing we've seen over the last couple of months in particular has been a whole sequence of storms, uh, monsoons, cyclones, various names for those things that are either the biggest recorded or the biggest in the last couple of decades or whatever. And they've caused devastation um, in uh, East Africa, in Iran, which saw serious flooding at the start of the year, and more recently in India, where a very large storm just hit the um, uh, the Bay of Bengal. Uh, if you look at Mozambique, for instance, which is one of the poorest countries in East Africa, uh, it got hit by uh, Irina, which caused this huge flooding. Uh, you know, uh, huge areas uh, were flooded, as you can sort of see from the map here. Uh, and those floods have only partially receded, uh, at least at last time I checked, as of a week ago. That they, in other words, those areas that look like they may remain permanently flooded or certainly for quite significant periods of time. There's new lakes have formed. Um, and that means, alongside the rain as well, of course, that means that uh, a lot of cropland was flooded and destroyed, perhaps at a key time of the year. I'm not sure what the uh, harvesting cycle is there. And lots of people's houses were also destroyed. Um, the uh, This is an area of the world where climate change was already meaning that uh, people were being pushed into food precarity. Uh, that um, I, I, had a I have a friend living in Tanzania. She be, told me about a conversation she had with some Maasai she was talking to, uh, where they were asking her about um, how he knew when it was going to rain and was there a way they could find this out on their phones. Um, and uh, they were saying, yeah, you know, the last few years, the crops haven't been what they're normally like because you know the rain hasn't arrived or it hasn't arrived at the right period of time or whatever and she said well yeah that's probably down to climate change and it turned out they weren't really aware of climate change um uh, so you know that the the people whose lives are already been affected uh, whose homes are being devastated uh, haven't made practically no contribution to this problem um, and may not even be aware that this is something that's happening elsewhere in you know that elsewhere in the world we're pumping out so much carbon dioxide uh, and methane uh, that their climates are changing because of this and that's what's actually hitting them um, so I think any movement in the global north uh, has a duty as such uh, to take that on board and to take colonialism into account and the historic record of who produces gases uh, when it's talking about climate change and how it's going to impact it. And this, as I'm going to go on to talk about, is important in terms of the rhetoric around declaring a climate emergency and who calls that climate emergency. Uh, what does that mean under the current governments we have? So another way of making a similar point about who has produced climate change uh, gas historically is this animation I came across. Uh, I'll just hit play on it. Um, and that shows you the uh, historic contributions of uh, various uh, countries as defined by their current national boundaries. That language is because obviously uh, if you want to look at say India, well that where exactly the boundaries of that has changed over time. So the graph works off those but you very much get the impression of just how big a contributor a small number of uh, global north nations have been particularly as you might expect the United States Britain and Germany um, and it's really quite late on that you begin to see some of the um, more developed economies of the global south in particular uh, India and China will start rising up here um, but the massive, massive historic contribution uh, coming from the Western countries. Uh, I mean, you can also see uh, in relationship to the rivalry between Britain and Germany, the way the two of those are sort of trying to pace each other as we go through there. And then once you hit 1945, Germany falls quite a long way down. Russia rises and then Germany comes back up. Um, but really, uh, you know, when you... Um, uh, climate change deniers in the current... Uh, period are always, uh, you know, trying to distract people with talking about the comparative role of China or India. But even those which are the most powerful economies of the global south have only really started to become relevant in the last decade or so. Um, and in fact, as we 
come up here, we can see China's sudden expansion and overtaking the United States is only 10 years or so um, old. Um, so again, if we think about the people of East Africa who've been recently getting hit very hard by the storms, uh, they don't feature in these graphs at all. They're, they're not anywhere uh, appearing on it. So where this combination of uh, apolitics or beyond politics uh, impacts in with colonialism and the historic production of carbon uh, dioxide in particular is when we look at the way some people in the Extinction Rebellion have talked about uh, climate-based migration uh, and in particular um, the way it's phrased in the Act Now statement on their website um, which I'll read out, it's on screen as well, but we are prepared for the danger of future holes. We face floods, wildfires, extreme weather, crop failure, mass migration and the breakdown of society. The time for denial is over, it is time to act. Now the problem with the way that's phrased is it simply lists mass migration in with uh, a list of clearly bad things. Um, and in the current context of the global north, where in both Europe and the United States, and indeed in Australia, uh, the far right are creating panics about migration, this is not good. Uh, this feeds into that particular panic. Uh, I mean, you can pretend to be unaware of it, you can pretend to be unaware of the background of the rise of the far right across Europe, of Trump in America, of the war, and all those things. And therefore say, oh, well, this is just an innocent phrase that got stuck in here. But that doesn't really wash very well. Um, given the historical legacy, given the current, who currently produces climate change gases, and also, as we've seen, given who's currently affected, uh, who's already dying uh, as a consequence of climate change, I don't think you can adopt a position of somewhere between a dog whistle to the racists and somewhere between maybe an innocent mistake. Uh, I think any climate change movement has to be a climate justice movement and has to unapologetically stand with the migrants who will uh, be forced and are being forced to relocate because of climate change. Most of that's happening within the countries that they live in. That's already happening on a large scale. It's been happening in Mozambique. Uh, it's probably been happening in India since the monsoon hit there last week. Um, but any climate justice movement has to clearly stand with those people and not use this sort of language that, you know, really could be read as simply being a dog whistle to racists. And apart from the moral imperative of that, um, you know, justice, that's basically what that is about. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is that um, it, there's a historic problem in terms of the far right latching onto environmentalism. I think there could be a naive expectation that, well, you know, surely concern about the planet is, is something of the left. Um, and I, there's a certain logic to that position. But historically, it's also been tied into far right ideas. And in particular, because the far right often pulls on uh, kind of mythologies of blood and soil. You know, the idea that people are rooted in a particular place, that, you know, that that's what makes them up and that therefore anybody else coming into that place is in some way an invader or usurper. Uh, and I mean, that particular expression, blood and soil, was actually one of the things that the Nazis used uh, to put out there as a concept. Uh, and that crossover goes back, as I said, to the 1920s, the 1930s. And even today, there's kind of a somewhat limited eco-fascist movement that's you know, seeking to use the threat of climate change and the threat, uh, the, the, the impacts that will have on people, the fact that some people are going to be forced to move, that some people are being forced to move uh, as a way to try to whip up racism. Um, you know, and the if you look at the modern day language of, of the far right, particularly in the States, particularly around Trump, um, it's very much tied into this whole idea of ethno states and uh, you know that, that that sort of separation of people so i think any sort of climate justice movement has got to go out of its way to be really careful to not stand with the far right on that question and to very explicitly stand them again stand against it and the problem is the language uh, extinction rebellion is currently using doesn't do that that needs to change um and that brings us on to the on the face of a reasonable sounding slogan uh, demanding that the governments uh, declare a climate emergency. 
um, you know, the comparison that's drawn is with World War II, um, you know, when the economies of the uh, Western countries uh, were put onto a war footing, all production shifted over to that as a purpose. So they essentially stopped making cars, for instance, and only made tanks. And that's part of the um, mythology uh, around the how fascism was defeated. Uh, of course, the fascists were also uh, putting themselves on emergency footing. So that should give us a first warning here that that's ambiguous. Um, again, the problem here is when you combine this idea of being beyond politics uh, with the idea that governments should declare a climate emergency. Because what does a climate emergency look like if it's called by the Trump administration, for instance? I mean, anybody who's following the US knows that his big struggle of the last year has been to try to find ways to force Congress to, field, to, to fund uh, the wall he wants to build along the Mexican border, and uh, he's exasperated that that's been stopped. Trump declaring a climate emergency would almost certainly involve funding his border wall, uh, probably using the excuse that climate change is leading to mass migration, the language that Extinction Rebellion have already been carelessly using. Um, even in the context of World War II, uh, if we go back to the colonial context, uh, then we need to think about, well, what exactly did that World War II climate, uh, that state of emergency mean for people in the colonial world? And a particularly horrific example of what it meant on the British side uh, was in Bengal. It led to a massive famine in 1943 uh, because things like the um, transportation of food uh, was being controlled and workers that you know, in what were seen as war industries were being fed and given medical treatment as a priority. Something like two to three million people died in Bengal as a consequence of that emergency. It also uh, saw the, the deliberate destruction of fishing boats, things like that, in case there was a Japanese invasion. So if you give right-wing governments emergency powers, then what they'll actually decide to do with those emergency powers may not be at all what you were actually intending to. Uh, I mean, another very obvious key issue that should be of concern is uh, nuclear power, uh, because quite a few people argue, and there's some justification for it, that uh, one response to climate change would be to switch from oil-fired and gas-fired power stations to nuclear-powered uh, stations, because they don't produce as much carbon dioxide. Uh, but of course, the problem is the waste they produce is hazardous. They're very dangerous um, uh, infrastructure if something goes wrong and of course we're always told they are safe until there's the next point of failure and it's discovered Fukushima or Chernobyl or whatever that it's not that safe and the problem is of course that if, if, if nuclear power plants malfunction it's disastrous you know it's it's not some sort of minor issue and uh, if we ha actually have a complete meltdown in one uh, then yeah that's going to be a pretty big disaster so again who gets power when you declare a climate emergency? What does that look like? What does it mean when you want to declare a climate emergency while declaring your beyond politics? How, what's that going to look like for the previously colonized world, for instance? Um, you know, all those sort of questions need to also be examined. Yeah. One thing to consider um, is the impact of uh, our current border regimes on people who are migrating. Some of that migration is happening because of climate change. Uh, there's a reasonably good argument that the Arab Spring had a relationship to climate change in that there'd been crop failures in the couple of years previous. This had reduced in soaring food prices and was part of the reason people rebelled. Uh, Syrian civil war, in turn, has a relationship to all that. That forces people to move. And the reaction of Europe in that context was to try and close the borders down. Uh, and when one of the major borders is the Mediterranean Sea, what that looked like was people drowning in the hundreds and thousands as they tried to come across that sea. Uh, rather than sending ferries to North Africa to pick people up, bring them uh, to Europe and then process, process them in terms of whatever asylum processes exist, instead uh, ways were found to make that journey as difficult as possible, I mean, to make it dangerous, to ensure at least that the first 20 or 30 kilometres was dangerous, so people were setting to sea in dinghies and uh, ships that were not suitable for trying to cross that distance, and huge numbers of people died as part of that, and that was kind of accepted. Uh, so again, we really can't fudge that as an issue. A climate change movement has to be a social justice movement. It has to take in the legacies of colonialism and racism into effect, and it has got to be pro-migrant. Uh, it cannot be neutral.
Um, so to boil it down again, what I'm basically saying is that a, a climate justice movement can't be beyond politics. It's got to actually be very political. It's got to also be involved with the issues people face in their everyday lives, whether that's about housing. It's got to be a, a very um, conscious, aware, and shape its message according to the leg legacy of colonialism, according to who actually does the polluting. Uh, and the people who pollute are the very rich, that's fairly straightforward, uh, but even that, they fall outside this beyond politics approach. And also most of us in the global north. Um, and we need to think of ways that we can reduce our consumption without the actual living standards of the mass of people in the global north being affected. I talked about transport, the way that could be done, a, a move away from individual cars to good public transport systems, uh, to shared cars, etc. all those sort of things. These are all really, really political questions that can't just be discarded. And when you get caught up in the idea of a climate emergency and handing power to the people who are currently in power, that becomes even more important. We don't want to do that. Um, what we need is a climate justice movement that is anti-capitalist, explicitly anti-capitalist, is anti-colonialist uh, and is intersectional. Um, and that is a movement not just on a single issue basis, but really a movement for a different sort of world. And I don't think we have any choice about that, because going back, uh, we looked at how capitalism is dependent on growth, how those two things are really linked, how that growth is going to have to double in the next 24 years if capitalism is to be stable. It's very clear that can't happen. None of those things. That can't happen. Uh, we can't be apolitical. We have to seek a major transformation of the way we live, uh, of the way the economy is structured, of the way the global south and the global north relate to each other. Um, all those things are part of a package of climate justice. Uh, you can't treat climate change as a single issue in the way that Extinction Rebellion have been treating it. So what you've just been listening is my first go at doing a podcast. I'm going to be calling it We Only Want the Earth, which is a famous James Connolly uh, quotation. Basically, uh, when people complain that you're looking for too much, it's a good reply to it. Uh, I'm also, it has an obvious relationship nowadays, however, to climate change in that we want the earth. We don't want to uh, end up somewhere where we can no longer live. Uh, I've recorded a longer segment that explains my why I'm doing that in more detail, which I'll upload at the same time, so go and look for that. Uh, I also already have a Facebook page set up with the same title of We Only Want the Earth. I hope you found this useful. If you have, I would encourage you to like and share it, because apparently that's how you get out and find more people. Uh, and also, uh, if you want to challenge me on anything, add, add information to it, uh, do use the comments. I will be looking at them. I'm going to try and respond to anything that isn't, you know, just obviously hostile trolling, and who knows, I might even respond to that. Anyway, hope you found this useful. Keep an eye out. I should be doing more of this in the future.